Hey class, today we're going to talk about uh, what I call congressional math. Uh, basically, it's the idea of how express powers of the uh, Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clauses 1 through 17, connect up with the uh, Necessary and Proper Clause, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18, to empower Congress to pass laws uh, to do what it needs to do to um, promote the general welfare and, and accomplish all the other tasks that it wishes to do. Uh, so I'm a big fan of analogies. And uh, so I'm going to uh, analogize the powers of Congress to a vacuum cleaner. Now, as you well know, uh, the express powers of Congress are contained in Article 1, Section 8 uh, of the U.S. Constitution. These are powers like, again, the power to uh, lay and collect taxes, the power to uh, coin money, to regulate bankruptcies, the power to uh, fight pirates on the high seas, to form a military, to declare war, and the list goes on. Well, like a uh, vacuum cleaner, uh, these powers are quite strong. Uh, they're very powerful, but limited. And um, let me give you an example. Uh, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1 gives Congress the power to lay and collect taxes. Okay, so that means Literally, Congress has the power to collect taxes. Well, I don't know about you, but that's a very powerful thing. Being able to legally take money from other people is a pretty powerful thing. With that said, um, it's limited because the power goes to Congress. And last time I checked, I've never had a congressman knock on my door and, you know, with a big sack with a dollar sign on it, asking me for my taxes. Uh, so how do we get Congress's power to lay and collect taxes over to the executive branch, which is the, uh, you know, the implementation arm of the U.S. government? Well, that's where... Uh, these powers come into being. So here's my analogy. Much like a vacuum cleaner, vacuum cleaners are very powerful things. Uh, they clean floors really well. They're very powerful. They suck up dirt and hair and all the rest of it, but they're not very versatile. Uh, you can't use a vacuum cleaner to clean the drapes effectively. You can do it, but it's not going to work out very well. Uh, and if you um, cohabitate, your partner is not going to be very happy if you attempt to use a vacuum cleaner as pictured on your drapes. Nor does a clean get into the corners particularly well. Uh, it doesn't have a fabric brush built in. So these this vacuum cleaner is this powerful thing, but it's limited in its usage. Enter what I refer to as congressional math, and you're going to know uh, be able to uh, analogize to the vacuum cleaner extensions. Clause 18. The necessary and proper clause is like a vacuum cleaner's attachments. It's very special. Now, by itself, it does nothing. Uh, much like the attachments. Uh, if you've ever used a vacuum cleaner before, you know there's the the attachment with the brush on the end, and there's that long nozzle one that kind of fits over the hose to get up in the corners or to clean the dust bunnies out from underneath the bed. But if you just wave that plastic stick around or the tube around unattached to the vacuum cleaner, it's not going to clean for you, right? That's like Clause 18. By itself, the necessary and proper clause does nothing. The necessary proper clause uh, is only effective when it is linked to expand Congress's authority to do whatever is necessary and proper to implement the express power that Congress is relying on 
to um, effectuate a law. So the by linking, for example, in our example, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, the power to lay and collect taxes, with the necessary and proper clause, Congress has the power to create the Internal Revenue Service. The executive branch department, or really uh, agency, that will collect the taxes on behalf of Congress and the government. Okay, so that means Congress doesn't have to go out and collect taxes. It has given that authority to the Internal Revenue Service by law, justified under Article 1, uh, Section 8, Clause 1, power to lay and collect taxes, and this necessary and proper clause. That's how this system works. And it is much like a vacuum cleaner and its attachments, because again, if you want to get up in that corner, you're not going to be able to pick up the vacuum cleaner and get it up there and vacuum your, the corner, but you can take the hose, attach the attachment to it, and reach up into the corner and do what you need to do. It focuses the power. So let's run through a couple examples. Clause 1, by itself, gives Congress the power to lay and collect taxes. Clause 18, by itself, does nothing. But Clause 1 plus Clause 18 can, for example, create the Internal Revenue Service, like we talked about just a moment, moment ago. Uh, clause 5 is Congress's power to uh, coin money. Well, if you link Clause 5 and Clause 18, the Necessary and Proper Clause, together, you create Congress's power to, to um, put into the stream of commerce a new newly designed $20 bill or a, a new $1 coin or to replace uh, the penny, to eliminate the penny. Uh, clause 10, the power of Congress to fight pirates. And Clause 18, the Necessary and Proper Clause, gives Congress the power to create the Coast Guard. Uh, I don't know about you, but I can't imagine uh, any congressman or woman or senator uh, you know, riding the high seas, uh, fighting uh, piracy wherever they find it, but I can imagine the Coast Guard doing it. Now, keep in mind, that doesn't create the Navy. The Navy is an independent uh, power under Congress to regulate and uh, finance a Navy. That's a separate power than the Coast Guard, which has its own distinct duties. Uh, what about Clause 3, the Interstate Commerce Clause? And Clause 18, well, that gives Congress the power to uh, uh, effectuate civil rights laws. Okay, yeah, let's talk about that one a little bit. Uh, the Commerce Clause is a particularly interesting um, clause. When I was in law school, my uh, professor, um, John Nowak, uh, was um, teaching us constitutional law. And when I say the guy wrote the book, I mean, he literally wrote our textbook on con law. And uh, the, it was the year of one of these cases that we're going to talk about here. And when there was a big change in the law, uh, Professor Nowak spent an awful lot of time, about six weeks, talking about the Commerce Clause, and very few of us really understood what was going on. We were 1Ls, and we really didn't have a clue. Um, let me rephrase that. My uh, law school uh, compadres certainly had a clue. They were some of the smartest people I've ever met. Uh, me, I didn't have a clue. So I really shouldn't toss them under a bus. It's only after teaching this stuff that I really got kind of got a better handle on how the Commerce Clause is supposed to work. So Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3, the Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. Now, what does all this mean? Well, let's talk a little bit about how the Commerce Clause has been interpreted over the years. Uh, and from 1789 to 1937, the Commerce Clause was interpreted in a pretty straightforward manner. Uh, the Commerce Clause was used to only regulate trade amongst the several states. Well, what does that mean? Well, 
let's look at the image here. Uh, you have um, the, the rectangular one in, uh, with the sharp points, sharp, sharp corners, and then you have another state, a hypothetical state, which is a little bit more elongated. Clearly, these are states uh, west of the Mississippi River because they are shaped like parallelograms. Uh, now, looking at these rays, um, which of the rays is intra-state within a state? And which of the rays is interstate? Yes, that's right. Ray AC is intrastate within a state, and ray AB is interstate between two states. Well, which of those rays involving commerce, so trade, commercial activity, can Congress regulate? Well, they can regulate interstate commerce, commerce between or amongst the several states. Who regulates intrastate commerce? Well, between 1789 and 1937, by and large, it was the state itself that would regulate trade within the state. Well, things changed a little bit. 1937 to 1995, uh, Commerce Clause interpretation was changed. It was broadened. Now, if you'll recall your U.S. history, in, 19, in the 1930s, there was this pesky depression going on. And uh, you'll remember FDR had uh, instituted his alphabet soup agencies, and uh, the U.S. Supreme Court was giving him some pushback. Um, they were not finding many of his uh, initiatives to be properly uh, national or interstate commerce, falling within the realm of interstate commerce. Consequently, they struck down several laws that uh, Congress had passed and FDR had signed as unconstitutional being um, unlawful expansions of federal power. Well, as you'll recall, that prompted FDR to uh, move forward with a court packing scheme uh, in an effort to uh, eliminate the conservative majority on the court. And the uh, court packing scheme failed, of course, but what it did was kind of fire a shot across the bow of these uh, elderly conservative um, justices, and a couple of them resigned or retired, really. And uh, FDR appointed uh, progressive justices who promptly reinterpreted the Commerce Clause uh, to move away from this um, narrow interpretation to a much broader interpretation. And the, one of the key cases of this was the uh, NLRB versus Jones and uh, Lachlan Steel Corporation. Um, what it did was basically say, look, Con commerce, the Commerce Clause, Article 1, uh, Section 8, Clause 3, would be broadened to include not just interstate commerce, but anything affecting interstate commerce. Well, my friends, if you think about it, everything affects interstate commerce, and that's precisely how the Supreme Court interpreted this. Um, this case and that fact. So the practical effect was that Congress began, because remember, every piece of legislation introduced by Congress must uh, be justified by some express power of Congress, you know, clauses one through 17. Well, Congress just started introducing legislation ev with everything being justified by the Commerce Clause because the Supreme Court had said they can basically regulate anything that is interstate commerce or affects interstate commerce. Well, let's look at the practical impact of that. Uh, now, I am using this uh, case and the fact pattern um, for my own instructional purposes. I highly encourage you to read Heart of Atlanta Motel versus United States. The facts of the case are a little different than how I'm going to present them. And the reason is because um, 
I want to put the focus on the, the interstate intrastate interaction here. In reality, it was the Heart of Atlanta motel owners who sued, but this could just have happened in the way I'm going to describe it. Uh, but this fact pattern, at least, is based on a real case that I encourage you to read. So imagine you are uh, traveling uh, and you are with your family and you're driving and you are starting in a state, let's, let's say Georgia, and you are a resident of Georgia and you're driving your car and you're going down a state highway and you need to stop off at gas, you're on your vacation and everybody's really excited. And you drive and you get to the gas station and you, it's a, it's a Amico. And so you, uh, pump gas and then you keep driving a little bit longer and you know people want to get some snacks so you stop for snacks and you get some beef jerky and I'm a big lover of beef jerky and you keep driving and it's getting a little late so you pull into a motel and you go into the front uh, desk and say hey we want to get a room for my family and I and the owner of the motel says no you can't stay here uh, we don't allow African Americans to stay in this hotel. Now, the year is 1964, and the uh, Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act were had just been passed and were in process. And so, um, and the family is an African American family. Now, how would the courts? handle a case like this. Let's say the family sues. Now again, this didn't happen in real life, but let's take this fact pattern and analyze it. Um, the owner of the hotel, the motel, would argue, hey, look, my motel is a Georgia corporation. It is dealing directly with Georgia residents in this case. This is an in, a matter of intrastate commerce, and thus a federal, a national law doesn't apply to these circumstances. And in fact, Georgia at the time had laws on the books that allowed for uh, discrimination uh, based on race within the state. And so this motel owner might argue, hey, I can exclude whomever I want uh, based solely on race and I'm following state law. Now, how would the family and their lawyers fight back? Well, um, let's talk about how this fact pattern either is involved in interstate commerce or affects interstate commerce. Where did the gasoline come from that was pumped into the car's tanks earlier in the trip, probably from outside of Georgia. Uh, how about the beef jerky? Chances are it didn't come from Georgia either. Uh, the neon that lit up the motel sign, the screws that held the hotel together, the, the tires, the rubber tires of the car upon which the family traveled, didn't come from Georgia. None of this came from Georgia. There's an interstate highway near the motel, which of course is engaged in, you know, travelers are engaged in interstate commerce. The point is, is that if anything affects interstate commerce, then everything can be regulated by the national government, including civil rights laws. Now, I highly encourage you to read Heart of Atlanta Motels because the case uh, does turn on issues like the interstate uh, highways being close by to the motel and the, the motel's uh, guests being made up of about 75% of out-of-state guests and thus clearly the motel was in the stream of commerce, uh, interstate commerce, and thus the civil rights laws applied to it just like uh, anything else. But I hope you understand how this expansive reading of this 
uh, congressional power meant that there was nothing that Congress couldn't regulate. Well, in 1995, the interpretation of the Commerce Clause changed. And this was the case, U.S. v. Lopez was the case that my uh, uh, law professor um, had uh, some great difficulty with because of a, a reinterpretation of something that had stood for 60 years, almost 60 years by this point. Uh, in 1995, uh, there was a case, U.S. v. Lopez, that made its way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And it, it involved a, um, a young man who had uh, brought a gun to high school, to a high school. He was attempting to protect himself with it. He, there was some gang issues where he was otherwise feeling threatened. Uh, this violated a recently enacted congressional uh, law, the Gun Free uh, School Zone Act. And effectively, what the Gun Free Zone Act said was, look, no one can possess a weapon within 500 feet of the boundaries of um, public buildings and this kind of thing, and schools were included in that. And this was effectively a attempt to um, control guns. Okay, it was a gun control bill. Well, Lopez's lawyers, and, and forgive me, the, the law had just been passed, and so the federal prosecutors um, wanted to use this case to advance their um, um, their law, okay? I mean, it, it was one of the first cases to be interpreted under this Gun-Free uh, Gun Zones Act. And so the federal prosecutors encouraged the state prosecutors to drop any state charges, and so it became a strictly federal prosecution. They prosecuted Lopez. Lopez's lawyers argued, look, this, this, this law has nothing to do with commerce, and it is, and of course it was justified under the Commerce Clause. And so uh, the case makes its way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court said, yeah, you're right. There is no rational connection between guns near schools and interstate commerce. And they struck the law down. Now, this sent a shockwave through constitutional law circles because this was a big change in reinterpreting uh, a clause of the con uh, Constitution that had underlied, un uh, you know, that, uh, that was relied upon for thousands of laws that the federal government had passed. And so Congress scrambled around and um, began in through legislative history justifying their laws under the um, uh, commerce clause how does this law impact interstate commerce and the economy and the uh, violence against women act was another law that uh, was adopted and in this very broad law there was a provision that provided a civil remedy to sue for gender-related violence, to sue in federal court if the state courts had turned down a case. And unfortunately, uh, that is what happened. There was a um, young lady who was uh, raped on a college campus. The state prosecutors and university did not um, effectively prosecute the claim uh, for a variety of reasons. Again, I encourage you to look up U.S. v. Morrison and read through the case. And so she uh, filed a civil action against the people that uh, she alleged raped her. And uh, under this Violence Against Women Act provision. And the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that there was no um, connection between violence, you know, having the civil remedy for violence against women and the 
interstate commerce clause, despite the legislative history that Congress had um, established. Nevertheless, they overruled this case as well under the com or under overruled this provision of the Violence Against Women Act. I hasten to add the Violence Against Women Act still exists. It has been renewed by Congress. Uh, it's just that the civil remedy uh, was struck down as unconstitutional. And that's the only case, or those are the only two cases where the U.S. Supreme Court limited the Commerce Clause interpretation. So where does that leave us? What can Congress regulate through the Commerce Clause? And I guess the answer is everything except guns near schools and suing perpetrators of violence against women. Those two carve-outs are the only exceptions to the universe of regulation that, Cong that Congress can engage in. Understand that this is a significant regulatory um, power of Congress. I hope this makes sense. Uh, please, let's talk about it as we move forward in class. Thank you very much. Take care.